When it comes to skin health, you may reach for those expensive creams. I mean, I've been there, lotions, potions, but should the first step, I suppose, in our skincare routine not be the food that we eat? Well, thankfully, there are plenty of things we can do without destroying our bank accounts. So, in the process of getting surgery or taking alternative care of your skin, or even changing up your lifestyle, food plays an important role here. So I really wanted to get someone on that knows what they're talking about here so we can have this discussion on diet and skin and go really deep. This week's Food for Thought sees the UK's first dual qualified consultant dermatologist and associate registered nutritionist, Dr. Thithi Marithapu, to share some key advice if you're looking for better skin. Hello, Thithi. Hi. Hi. Lovely to be here. I can't believe it. We got a date in because yes. we've been discussing it for a long time. And skin health and diet is a bit of a minefield. Absolutely. There's so much out there. It's so difficult to find accurate information because there's just everywhere you turn, there's all sorts of misinformation. It's in mainstream media. I find that, um, you know, skin and diet is often something that when I grew up, oh, this celebrity in the glossy magazines has, you know, this diet, they're eating this and this is why their skin looks so good, you know. And of course, back then I was naive to the fact there was even Photoshop and airbrush. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And I imagine today, now it's online everywhere. Yes, and everyone's an expert, that's the thing. So, you know, you might have had one spot once and maybe you, you know, change your diet slightly and you're now the expert on spots and what you should eat if you have them. And you've got a YouTube video and it's got a, a million downloads and that can really snowball and can spread you know, all sorts of nonsense information really quickly. I mean, I'm not the only one, I'm sure, but I've tried a lot of skin methods. So if you get that one big white head, so I'm that type of person where I think I'm quite lucky naturally with my skin, but when I get one, I get a corker of it. Yes. Oh, they're big. And you're told, <laughs> you're told not to pop it, right? Yes, yeah. Which I've it's learned. So it's so tempting. It's so tempting. I used to do that and I was like, oh no, I mustn't pop it anymore. And then I already put toothpaste on it. So we'll get into all of this because yes. I could see your face when I said toothpaste. Let's start. Do the toothpaste. Let's not do toothpaste. <laughs> Let's begin with what is the skin? It's our largest organ. Can you describe that for us? Yeah, so your skin is amazing. And I think often we forget how incredible it is. It's busy all the time. And yet it gets judged on one thing. It just gets judged on how it looks. Yeah. And yet it's sensing the temperature. It is protecting us from allergens. It's protecting us from light in the environment. Obviously, it's covering up the entirety of our surface. It gives a lot about our identity as well, the tone of your skin. So it's very busy. Your skin is always up to something. But sadly, we only really care about how our skin looks. Yeah. Even when you say all those factors, you know, our immune system, yeah. the... Is it the natural flora that we have? Yes, and all? I yes. remember it's, even in primary school, I remember doing fingerprints, you know, yeah. on paper when yeah. you put your fingerprint in ink. And um, I guess it all comes together as you grow up. You realise, wow, yeah. our bodies are impeccably amazing. Amazing. And you're so unique. Your fingerprints are unique. Your skin microbiome, the bugs that live on your skin, vary between people. They vary between twins. They vary across your lifetime. So, you know, your skin is so unique to you. And that's why I often see people who say, look, I bought the skincare routine that I saw online and it's not working for me. And that's because, you know what, just because it works for one person or one celebrity doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Exactly. And one area that I love about your work is obviously your nutrition. The fact that you actually look at the research and the data. So are there specific foods? Let's go in with that yes. the first big question. What foods are non-negotiables in your eyes yes. in terms of our skin health? So I broadly put it into categories and I came up with GLOW to make it easy for people to remember. So I think everybody needs to have the G, green. So that's fresh yeah. fruits and vegetables. Common sense, right? And then the L is lean protein. And that can be plant-based. It can be animal-based, whatever you prefer. And the O is healthy oils. So we need good fats. Of course we do. And finally, it's the W, which is whole grains. And that's mm. the thing people always try and miss out. They're mm. kind of always trying to cut back those carbs. But those things are not only important for your skin health and for your gut health, but your general health as well. So if you're eating like that for your skin, you're going to be looking after yourself internally as well. The beauty of that is that it's basically a Mediterranean diet, 100%, right? 100%, yes. And Mediterranean diet, as we know, is one of the most researched diets in the world. Yes. And we've got heart health benefits, longevity, blue zones talk about it. So in your clinic, it must be so interesting when you see people about their skin and you're saying, look, your diet can make a difference here. Yes. How big a difference anecdotally 
do you see in your clients or people coming to you with dietary changes? So I would say it varies from person to person. So it really is a spectrum. For some people, the dietary changes, uh, for example, if they have a pre-existing skin concern, let's say psoriasis, making some dietary tweaks can make a huge difference. There are some people who are just genetically programmed to have certain skin concerns and actually they need more medical treatments. But a healthy balanced diet is important whatever you're coming to the clinic with it's important for everyone as we know you know we need to protect all different aspects of our health yeah but specific dietary tweaks you've got to make them depending on what your skin concern is it's not the same across the board no which we need to hammer home my yeah. favorite saying is we're as unique as our personalities because yes. I feel yeah. that should apply to every area of life but sadly not everyone has the access to gain that information that's bespoke and I feel that the online world now attracts a lot of vulnerable people that are desperate for answers and I suppose the question to caveat the first question on what should you eat is what shouldn't you eat <laughs> so uh, you know I think I totally believe in everything in moderation and I think if you've got a specific food allergy obviously you need to avoid that there are some people who have an intolerance and they need to be careful and mindful of those foods so I wouldn't say across the board there are you know there's one particular food that you need to omit I would say for some people with psoriasis some people with eczema and some people with breakouts dairy can be a trigger um, but it's not the same for everyone who's got those skin concerns. And I think you need to be really careful about willy-nilly cutting out dairy, particularly young women, bone development, all of those things mm. are so important for our health. And I think it shouldn't be done without really seeing a professional and making sure if you are going to try a dairy-free period, you see someone, you see a nutritionist, you see a dietitian. And you make sure you do it in a way that you're going to meet your daily needs in another way. You're going to meet your calcium, all of the other micronutrients in dairy. Yeah. You're going to do that properly. We have to touch on that, actually, because I think there's a stat. It's one in three women over the age of 50 develop osteoporosis. Yeah, so important. It, yeah. And whilst, of course, you can get calcium, bone supporting, you know, phosphorus or vitamin D from other areas in your diet or you supplement your vitamin D, of course, but if you don't know what you're doing when you cut out a food group and you're not actively making a conscious effort to consume those other foods, you're putting yourself at risk. And surely that equally affects the skin when you suddenly cut out a food group too. Yes. So I, I do see people who are very strict with their diet and there are skin consequences that. So if you have an extremely low fat diet, you're avoiding all healthy fats as well your skin can become dry. Mm. You can lose those essential fatty acids that you need for your skin barrier, which keeps the moisture within your skin. And you can get really dry skin, very dry hair as well. Again, these restrictive diets do have knock-on effects. You can, you know, there are people who are really afraid of eating. I have some people I need to make sure they're seen by an eating disorder specialist very early on. They're so frightened to eat anything because they think, will it flare my eczema? And, you know, those people can develop, you know, iron, B12 deficiency. Mm. So I always have to do a big panel of that when I see them. That's debilitating for people when you think about it. And I can only imagine, no matter what age you are in life, actually, I suppose our face is something that a lot of people feel, you know, it's on it's on show all the time. It can affect your self-esteem psychologically. That's huge. Huge. So I think that's the problem with skin and nutrition. Because your skin is so visible, people are really vulnerable to misinformation mm. because they want it gone quickly. And sometimes it takes a long time to see a specialist. Mm. Sometimes people are frustrated with what they're offered and they think, well, I'll just do my diet. That's fine. Mm. You know, I'm, I need to get rid of this immediately. Let me just cut out all these food groups. And, you know, and then they can be very frustrated with the consequences. I get people yeah. who have spreadsheets of foods that they've cut out and they come and see me and, you know, it is just, yeah. you know, a nightmare to sort all of that out. Yeah, and they're lucky they're seeing you, someone that understands that, because I'm sure a lot of dermatologists won't actually pick up or ask those questions to ascertain whether there is a problem there as well that needs addressing. You know, the knock-on consequences of dietary restriction and nutrient deficiencies, but I'm sure not everyone does. Well, it's getting a lot better. So we do a lot of um, uh, speaking and promotion and, and things like that at King's. We do a lot of talks yeah. uh, for dermatologists and dermatology specialists, nurses, we're really trying to improve the understanding and we're also doing research in the area so that we get really good quality information out there for people who live with skin concerns as well as people who look after them. Because skin conditions are common, but what, I mean, eczema is very common. My two little boys have got um, very mild eczema on their arms and they have done since they were a baby. Is eczema something people can grow out of or can develop at any time in life? So eczema is really interesting. So it's very common in children, as you know, yeah. many children 
children can have a little bit of eczema. They often grow out of it, particularly the teenage years are usually quiet, but then sometimes it can reappear later on in life. I have quite a few women who've got eyelid eczema that's developed later on in life or hand eczema that's oh. developed, so it can resurface. So if you are prone to eczema, yes, it can clear for long periods of time, but there is a possibility it can recur. And looking after your skin barrier is therefore really important. And you do that internally as well as externally with creams and lotions yeah. and things like that. It's the internally bit that I don't think people realise, the yes. gravitas of what they're doing. Because yeah. a lot of these things online, you know, don't look after gut health. You're taking pills, concoction shakes because they're promising a miracle solution not thinking about the consequences it might have, for instance, on our gut microbiome. So mm. we have to go there. What about this, the skin brain access? Or yes. is there a specific skin microbiome you can discuss? So, yes, the gut skin access is yes. amazing. It's so interesting. But we in skin are a little bit further behind on the research. Mm. We don't have those great studies that they have for example, for the brain gut access. Yeah. You know, that, that's fantastic. I know, it's the amazing. The evidence is so cool. Yeah. So we would love to replicate that, but we're not there yet. There have been small studies in, for example, psoriasis, looking at the impact of probiotics predominantly, and larger studies in children who have eczema as well, very few studies in adults with eczema. So mm. I would say the quality of our data is not really as good, but there's definitely um, some interesting data there. And really, when we look at eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, acne, acne yeah. you know, the four commonest skin concerns, we can see changes in the gut microbiome. We can see less of those good bacteria that we want and less diversity. I mean, I'm making a big generalisation. Certainly not yeah. everyone with those yeah. conditions is going to have that. But from the data, it looks like that's a possible signal that needs further explanation. It just makes sense to me that what we eat is going to affect our body anyway. Yeah, surely yeah. the better quality or the higher quality diet you have, the more likely, I know that obviously genetics plays a role. You'll get those people that eat a shocking diet, that have amazing skin. Yes, I They're know. All... They're really annoying, those people, aren't <laughs> <Yeah>. they? <laughs> you always get those people. And I think gen obviously there's the nature-nurture debate isn't yes. there in every area of scientific research. But with skin in particular, I just think, why not try something that you can control three times a day yes. rather than spending a fortune on these extra creams and pills. You don't need to spend a lot on skincare, really. Yeah. You know, and actually money spent on your diet is better is a better investment for your long-term health. Yeah. I actually don't think there's a lot of point spending a fortune on your skincare if you're not going to look after what you're eating as well. And by that, I don't mean a restricted diet. I just mean a good, balanced diet, exactly what you promote as well. Yeah. You know, really being sensible about it. Of course we have treats. Yeah, that's yeah. important. But it's just being really sensible about it. So when it comes to, so we've touched on eczema lightly, but when it comes to acne, which I think probably is the most common thing most yes. people experience yeah, with, yeah. in terms of yeah. skin, um, when does acne really start to develop? And you can have adult acne, of course, as well. So adult acne is really common, and I think people don't realise how common it is, and they suffer in silence for a long time. So often we see acne in our teenage years, but it's definitely not just a teenage problem. And in the teenage years, hormones are doing all sorts of things. And some people are lucky enough, they grow out of it. Yeah. But there are many people in my clinic who have acnes in their 30s, their 40s, yeah, persistent adult acne. Mm. Um, and in terms of diet and acne, I mean, acne is primarily driven by genetics and hormones. But for some people, food really does play a role. And I know that from all the people who sit in front yeah. of me and tell me that. And um, there's some research to back it up as well. And I do discuss that in the book. But the two sort of common uh, dietary themes in acne would be a diet high in refined sugar, sugar yeah. lots of sweet things, and um, a diet with lots of milk. And by that, we really are looking at skimmed milk that has come out of the data as being more linked oh, to having yeah. acne. But again, there are people who have all of those things and never have acne. There are people who cut all of those things out and their acne persists as well. So again, this one size does not fit all, but those are things to be mindful of. I think it's really important. We actually recorded an episode on environmental changes and, you know, reducing the amount of these items anyway, you know, animal produce in general. It means people could still have them, mm -hmm. but just slightly reduce the quantity. So yeah. perhaps for some people, simple changes, it's instead of having three glasses of something a day, just have one. Yes, or just have a little bit in your, you know, granola or your cereal yeah. or whatever. Or, you know, you could you can just be mindful about your sugar intake. And we're not talking about 
going keto. You don't need to go so, keto to cure your skin. I'm sure you <laughs> see that a lot. So all sorts of diets. One yes. of my bugbears in the clinic is ketogenic diets yeah. because very short-term weight loss, it's effective but not healthy. How do you sustain that? It's unsustainable. Yeah. It's bad for your gut microbiome, yes. cutting out the fiber. And I can imagine that a glow a terminology used yeah. at the start that is not glowing no in fact you lose quite a bit of facial fat with the keto wow. diet and it's linked to a very rare rash oh. yeah called a keto rash i saw a lady in clinic the other day who had it she wanted to lose weight for an event she went on keto and she came in with this rash i was like what is this and it was keto rash and if you drop your carbohydrates below okay. about 30 to 50 yeah. grams a day this very red itchy rash can develop so you know and if you just bump up your carbs it goes yeah. as simple as that that's blow my mind isn't it amazing it's amazing that the body is telling you look this does not suit me yes exactly well, I a... mean there's medical conditions where keto diet well, helps right epilepsy for yes. children is the proven very specific area. But... that is specific but a lot of people do it because they see it online they yes. see people saying this is the key to weight and weight loss is hailed as this healthy thing mm. weight loss isn't healthy for everybody and that that's an extreme way to grow yeah. about it isn't it and I yeah. think you get obsessive when you do something like that, counting grams, checking, check, just yeah. checking too much. And I think anything that leads to obsessive eating habits, you've got to be yeah. so mindful of. And there's the misconceptions like we touched on that acne disappears as a teenager and then it doesn't. What about people that you see that want to go on all sorts of medication for their skin? I think a common one people have heard of is Raractane. Yes. So there are lots of different treatment mm. options if you have acne. Yes, of course, you can, you know, look at dietary factors. But for many people, actually, you know, they need medical skincare so we use specific prescription skincare ingredients that are great for acne and the next level up for that sometimes we use tablets and the next level up from that there are stronger tablets Ractane being one of them for women if you've got hormonal acne there are other options as well there are certain types of contraceptive pill or a tablet called spironolactone so we have a lot of options so if you are struggling with your acne and you think right you know I've done this dairy business and that's definitely yeah. not doing it and I'm careful with my sugar intake what can I do yeah. that you know we have a lot of options for treating acne and would you say that Everybody does this ethically in the sense that they say, look, you're taking medication. Perhaps you do need to up your probiotic consumption of foods at the yes. same time, that sort of thing. Cause surely trialing all this medication, I know because I get DMs from people yeah. all the time. Obviously, I can't offer information. Yes. It's not my area. But it's fascinating to see a lot of people struggle with this medication to medication. So I, so one of the treatments we use for acne is antibiotics, and it can yeah. be really effective for some people. But if you're going to take that, you need to be really mindful of your gut microbiome. And it's something we talk about all the time in the clinic. And there are many ways that you can do that. Of course, you can look after how many plants that you're eating. Yeah. You can eat plenty of pre and probiotic foods. For some people, that, that can also mean taking a probiotic during that period of time. And... I, you know, in the clinic, that is something I talk about. And when I lecture, that is something I recommend for my colleagues as well. Yeah, I think it's really important. It's crucial. I think too flippantly in the past, we know that antibiotics were just dished out almost, weren't yes. they? Let's be honest. Now we know there's a rise in cases of antibiotic resistance. Yes, you can get antibiotic resistance, but, um, you know, we use these for short periods of time. Exactly. And I think the issue was in the past, people took them, you know, really long courses yeah. without being supervised and you yeah. have to be careful about how you use everything you and know? please see someone obviously like yourself my biggest advice for listeners now is that you know i filmed a documentary the other week on the um weight loss jabs the injections oh, there's you? a big yeah. black market for people purchasing things online they yes. can purchase items you don't know what's in them mm. please see a specialist or someone that's going to help you because you can end up in a very difficult situation if you just go up i know people are desperate they want to feel better but Doing that online is not the answer, is Definitely it? Definitely not. And people, you know, do, you know, unwittingly buy things online that can be very harmful for them. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure creams must come into this market yes, as well. I'm just yeah. talking about pills. Love skincare. Yeah. Let's talk about skincare. Yeah. Because... I mean, it's just everywhere. And yes. sometimes I feel, um, oh, gosh, I'm not doing enough. You know, I'm aging now and all that sort of stuff. As if. <laughs> well, you know, I'm embracing it. I don't actually <laughs> mind so much. I'm quite content in myself. But I do feel like there's this subliminal pressure for a woman particularly. I'm sure men get it too. But yes. being a woman, I can obviously represent women and feeling we feel like we should have this epically big skincare routine. Do you know, I think a simple, effective skincare routine is it. Good. And, you know... I some people enjoy the 10 step thing that's their downtime same I mean 
I, I couldn't, I don't know how no. to factor that into my day. No. But, you know, if you enjoy that and that's part of your wind down routine and your skin is looking great on it, fine. I see people who do too much to their and skin. And it must cause harm. Yes, you can end up with rosacea and redness because what you're doing, if you're doing a lot of peels and acids, you are disrupting your skin microbiome and your skin barrier. And you need to look after your barrier to protect your skin function for the long term. So actually, I often really pare down a skincare routine and say, you know what, why don't you give that to a friend or family who is, you know, looking yeah. for that sort of product and you just stick to this very simple skincare routine and you don't need to spend a lot either. Yeah. I really think that, you know, some people get carried away with spending hundreds of pounds on products, which isn't really necessary. Well, what about these lights? So I see a lot of people yes. that obviously they're in very privileged situations yeah. and just to um to let our listeners know you, you can buy the same product in a shop owned variety, right? Versus yeah. a particular brand. They're gonna have the same ingredients. Often yes. So it can depend on the formulation can be quite different. So it depends what they're combining it mm-hmm. with. And the vector. So what is the base? Because that can help products to get absorbed. So there are some Explain that to us. What is the base? So it's what is, is it in a gel or is it in a lotion or is it in an ointment? And I guess something that's really interesting for us to talk about is look at your skincare ingredients. They're all vitamins. Yeah. Vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E, (laughs) niacinamide. Basically, what you're putting on it's your the words skin, people won't recognise because yeah. they don't say vitamin A. They'll say the actual name. Retinol. Yeah, retinol. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, it's amazing that we've been using skincare, which is vitamins, for all this time. But we haven't thought, well, I need to eat these vitamins More. in my diet to look yeah. after my skin as well. So, you know, you're... You need to do it on the inside, on the outside. So it's. I just urge all of you go and have a look at your skincare yeah. and have a look at the ingredients because I bet you'll be amazed. At and how if many it's of them. in date, I had things that were not in date. You know, you yeah, just realise that because <laughs> they just sit there. And I think sometimes I'm. I'm like you. I'm very simple. I'm just a quick wash and moisturise, take off the makeup, cleanse, moisturise. Yes. I have time. Yeah. But I do believe less is more in yes, this area yeah. because I. I have witnessed it. I don't know. I'm not a skin expert at all. I'm not a dermatologist like yourself, but I see people that do too much. Yes. And then they buy into these lights. Yes. What does that uh, do? So there are different types of lights. There's blue lights, red lights, red lights I've green seen. light. And actually the evidence behind them is good, Ooh. but you need to be mindful of what machine you get to make sure you're getting enough of it. Because oh. if you're not getting the right dose, you might not see the results that you want. So I actually do like red light. And I've used blue light before, helps with acne, but you've got to get the right device. So what does red light do? So red light is good for rejuvenation and redness. So it boosts collagen production in the skin. So I do need to get a red light. So that's quite nice. And if you can do, put your red light on, maybe do like a 10 minute meditation if you have time. That's a really good use of your time. Oh, I'd love it. So um, I need to pick your brains afterwards of what brands you'd recommend getting of red lights. Um, Let's touch on collagen. I have to go there. It's absolutely it's everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. And to this point, unless you change my mind, I've refused to kind of go there for a lack of evidence. But if there is, so, please change my mind. Well, so I, I, I really tried to look at all of it and I tried to do it objectively. And do you know, there is some evidence for it improving skin hydration. What I can't say is that it's going to dramatically improve pre-existing Aging. lines and wrinkles or prevent it in the long term. But the data for skin hydration, so, you know, generally smoothing the skin seems to be reasonable. The caveat to that is all the studies are sponsored by the people who make the, um, yeah. the, the, make supplement. the supplement. Exactly. And I think there are, you know, there aren't studies that have really compared dose for dose whether they're bovine or fish derived. And then there are vegan collagen supplements which don't actually have collagen in them as far as I'm aware. Most of them don't. They just have things that are meant to support collagen. But collagen is essentially a bunch of amino acids and you need vitamin C yeah. to perform, to put, to make Structure. proper collagen. You need iron as well. So you, you could just take the collagen, but if you're not getting all the extra added bits, it's difficult to say you're going to really see much in the way of results thank you for clarifying that because a lot of people say this is my morning routine yeah i'm gonna have a quick shake with some collagen yeah. in it, which might work if it's got vitamin c but we don't know the quality of the supplement the powder yes. where yeah, it's from all different yeah every single one is different and you know the only way you can really tell is if you try it for three months and you don't change your skincare routine and you really you know take a picture at the beginning and see if you see any improvement and if it doesn't don't buy it again. No. Don't just invest in something blindly yeah. in the hope that it might be doing something. And what about just eating more protein or biotin? You could definitely just eat more protein in your diet. Biotin supplements we're always a bit careful of mm. because 
I mean, almost no one is biotin deficient. I know. I find it fascinating. It's one of the vitamins that you just don't really need more. You don't, exactly. And I don't really know where it kind of came came from. from. Yeah, it's bizarre. And it can interfere with so many blood tests. So I'm really mindful about it. Doesn't it mask the um, anemia rating? Uh, From my understanding, it can interfere with hormonal blood tests. tests. So if you're having thyroid blood tests and things like that, it can interfere with that reading. And the the one that's really scary is the heart attack blood test. Of course, yeah, yes, I so, read about that. Yes, I think somebody, the test came back negative wow. because they were on biotin supplements. So I think you really need to be careful with that. And it's in everything. Supplements are, see, I have my own supplement company and we just sell what's evidence-based by the yes, NHS, which yeah. limits it to about four or five products. Because you just don't need it. You don't need it. And people do things they really don't need to do. They take too much selenium for Mm. one. It's in every hair, skin and nail supplements. And if you take too much selenium, you can actually shed hair. Yeah. So it's totally unnecessary. Really counterproductive. Um, Hormones, genetics. Let's talk about this because, you know, as we all know, we're unique. We discuss it. And some people naturally have great hair. Other people have great skin. Some people are tall or small. Yeah. Let's talk about it with skin. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So some people have more oily skin. Some people have drier skin. Some people are prone to pigmentation. And we all age a bit differently as well. And that is dependent on our skin type as well. Ethnicity. It's such an important factor. So for instance, darker skins like I am will age differently. I think you've got better aging. uh, Well, you know, we've got built in some protection. Doesn't mean we shouldn't use SPF. You need to use it as well. Yeah. But we can get pigmentation and we will see aging differently. So rather than fine lines and wrinkles we can get dark spots and we can get sagging so aging looks different depending on your skin type and you do need to be aware of that i think it's so important my godmother she she won't mind me saying this so she's black and she's got the most beautiful skin she lives in south africa she's exposed to the sun but she's always used sun cream yeah so important she looks like she's still 40 years old yeah so you you, the sunscreen is everything so sunscreen every day yeah really good diet and a simple skincare routine I think, you know... I mean, she's gl- literally glowing. Oh. And whenever I see her, like, I need your secrets. I know that I've got white skin and it is going to age very differently. But I think sun protection, I can see a difference having Absolutely. used it the last two years yeah. consistently, it's even really in the winter. Important. Yes, all year round. Make sure, obviously, get your vitamin D. Yes. But you, need to, you really need to be diligent with your sun protection. It is the easiest thing you can do that is going to mean you need to do much less and much less expensive things later on. So my last question before we go on to questions from listeners, there's so much to cover in this episode. Fillers, Botox. Yes. I would love your thoughts on them because it seems worrying to me that people are doing it younger and younger. However, perhaps I'm missing something here and it it, it does have benefits to do it younger. So, you know, each to their own. But I really believe that you should do everything first. You should do the diet. You should do a great skincare routine. You should manage your stress. You've got to look after your gut. That's got to be the foundation. And then if you think, you know what, these few lines are really bugging me. If I get a bit of Botox, maybe that will help. I think you have to do everything, get your foundation right, and then you can build that on top of it if you want to. I think people are doing it too young. I think people are having filler at very young ages. And I do see people who, you know, I don't do Botox, but I, you know, have seen people who've had it and they'll have their Botox and go out and have a cigarette and they're in their 20s. Drink, and they're you're out binging. Out binge drinking, you know, all of those things that are counterintuitive to your skin and health. There is no point doing the Botox unless you're really looking after everything else. Because, yes, Botox may improve lines and wrinkles, but you want skin quality. You want skin radiance. And all of those things are going to come from your amazing skincare routine, a really nice, simple one, wearing your sunscreen, looking after your diet. You've got to do the whole package. It's not a quick fix. Yeah. If you know that in your family, for instance, skin isn't one of your major bonus point areas, yes. then let's get that SPF on and yeah. let's try and eat as well as we can and do what we can first before yes, thinking. exactly. Yeah. And, you know, all of the, there are great, you know, there are all different types of injectables you can now yeah. have in your face, not just Botox, not just fillers. There are things that can, you know, introduce vitamins essentially yeah. to support skin function. And, you know, some people get great results from that, but you've got to go to someone who knows what they're doing and make sure you've really exhausted your other options before you go down that route yeah lots of people will talk about it as you said at the beginning beauty therapists or different people but i really i've on i've learned from doing this podcast over the years that dermatologists that specialize in these areas are the ones to really listen to to get your skincare information you can be sold anything at a massage (laughs) yeah 
<laughs> or something like that. Um, so questions from our listeners. The first one, Harveen. Now she said, what is your ultimate whitehead cure? So if you've got a big spot, yeah. pimple plaster. Pimple plaster? Pimple What's plaster? that? So you can get these little gel uh, patches and you pop them on your spot and they really dry them up overnight. So if you've got a big event the next day and you get a spot, stick one on straight away. Well, and then just concealer the next it, day. And then, no, when you take it off, they shrink. Oh, it helps goodness. to draw out what's in them. Wow, much yes. better than the toothpaste. Yeah, much better than toothpaste <laughs> or the fingers. Oh, yeah. I know, the fingers. Yeah. Because you spread the inflammation if you do that. And you the can scar. scar. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's a good question. Now, Amy said, is alcohol affecting our skin and our sleep? You know, I'm eating a lot of sugar and nuts, She's basically confused. So what I would say, you know, you did ask me earlier, what was the one food that I think Mm. you should be careful of? But actually alcohol, it's really boring. But alcohol makes so many skin concerns worse, whether you've got a bit of redness, a bit of eczema, psoriasis, alcohol is, you know, on my naughty list. Have it once in a while. Be mindful of what you have. So be careful not to have those cocktails that are super sugary, obviously. You know, you can have them once in a while as a treat, but you don't want to be having them regularly. But yeah, alcohol and skin. And if you have excess alcohol consumption, more than about seven or eight glasses Mm. of wine a week, it increases fine lines and wrinkles. One of the big things in the nutrition clinic that we had, I'd say it was more when I started the clinic. Drinking's less, it seems to be less popular. I have noticed a difference. I bet, yes. But people used to always have a bottle of wine between as a couple in the night or a glass or two every night. If you can cut your alcohol consumption and make it an occasion drink rather than a weekly drink... I think that's going to have a big impact on your skin health. People are surprised at how much difference it makes. Yeah. Let's talk about omega-3 because uh, Jess's question is... um, Sorry, no, it's Harveen. I've read the wrong name. Sorry, Harveen. She said, which foods cause skin inflammation? So I wouldn't say there's one particular food, but things we're mindful of. Alcohol, as I've mentioned, but also a diet high in refined sugar yeah. because it can accelerate skin aging by the production of these compounds called ages, yeah. which make collagen a little bit stiffer. And then, you know, we know what happens when your collagen isn't working as Is well. Is that linked to glycation? It's glycation, it exactly. Glycation. So, um, you know, you want to be mindful of your sugar. It doesn't mean you have to cut it all out. No. I like sweet things as much as the next person. Do you know what yeah. I mean? I'm not going to say no to nice gelato. But you just have to be careful about it. I love a nice gelato. (laughs) Um, So Jess had said, I have a really stressful job. And as a result, my skin health suffers. What can I do? So stress and the skin are really closely linked. There is a brain skin axis in the same way that there is a gut skin axis. Um, And, you know, some people come out in hives when they're nervous. Some people get a big spot the day before they've got a big event. Mindfulness practice is something I talk about a lot in the book. Um, And I think you know, trying to introduce an easy mindfulness practice, whether that's, you know, a guided meditation is a really good first step to helping to support your brain and skin. Absolutely, absolutely. And then Josie, this is something that it used to, I don't live in London now, but it used to be on my mind all the time was pollution. Yes, yeah. How so does that impact our skin? It definitely does. So pollution can increase the appearance of pigmentation, irregular p- pigmentation on the wow. skin, which is a feature of skin aging. So, wow. you know, you can get antioxidant serums. As I mentioned, vitamin C is our power yeah. antioxidant. Yeah. So um, vitamin C is a great antioxidant. You can easily introduce into your skincare routine a serum or a moisturiser before your sunscreen, and that helps uh, to fight and free radical damage. And will they see that on the, page, on the bottle? as a school bag or will they see it as vitamin C? You know, there are all different brands and they use yeah. all different types of vitamin C yeah, that are buffered with different things. It's quite, if you, if you can get a vitamin C that's buffered with ferulic acid, that can really help ferulic to acid. improve its antioxidant effect. What are your views on, sorry, I've, t- I've bumped into the last question because the other, the other question was about, fa- oh, that is a good one actually. Lisa, <laughs> sorry, Lisa, I'm going to do your question. That was really rude of me. I've just got one. I don't want to forget it. Um, she said, my foundation is SPF 15. I use it every day is it enough not enough Mm. you need a separate sunscreen because you need half a teaspoon to get the number on the bottle so do you use half a teaspoon of? so i have a look i'm very lucky i i can afford to buy this type i buy a factor 50 for the face and that's the first thing i love it though because it spreads so nicely so i think exactly so factor 50 before and then put whatever makeup you want want afterwards because many of us are not going to use half a teaspoon of foundation on our whole face no. to get that factor 15. Should you moisturise before that or after? Because I actually... Oh, okay. What do you do? I just shove the SPF on and then I go. That's okay. <laughs> if, if your skin doesn't need more than that, 
that's fine. Oh God, it's embarrassing. No, don't oh, worry. If you don't, blushing. <laughs> if you don't need it, but some people don't need it, you okay. know. Some people. So there's, a, you know, a very good uh, SPF with um, a moisturizer with SPF built in. I use a lot in the clinic. You don't need a separate. SPF for that one because it's a great combination. I, think I have one like that. I yeah. do think it's like that. It feels like moisturizer. Yeah. So if if you like the texture and your skin feels hydrated, that's great. Fantastic to know. What was the oh the question I was going to ask you? Oh, I can't, was it? I think it was omega three related. Omega three. Yes, yeah. The so benefits of omega three. Yeah. So if you're vegan or vegetarian and or you've got a fish allergy, which you know some of my patients do because they've got eczema and they can't eat. Oily or fish, they just don't eat oily fish. Or they don't eat oily yeah. fish, you must supplement properly. Okay. And too often I see people who really don't, you know, yeah. consume any oily fish and they're not supplementing and it can result in dry skin but flares of other skin concerns. So I've seen people whose eczema is flaring when they've decided to cut foods out like oily fish. Yeah, so, so it is an important thing that you need to remember to supplement. Take an algae one if you prefer, just make sure you are supplementing yeah. it properly. Now, I'm aware that in this episode, we haven't discussed individual skin conditions. That's purely because I just think they deserve bespoke attention. If you really need help, please contact. Who do they contact if they need to speak to anyone? So the GP, um, the GP is your first point of call and they can refer you on depending on what your skin okay. concern is. So you is. can get a referral to a dermatologist. Yes, you can, yeah. Your GP. And there's lots of good information on the British Skin Foundation website as well. Which is good to know. So we move on to our fact or fiction round. <laughs> Are you excited? Yes. I can't wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she said it now. I can't wait. If you could answer fact or fiction yes. to the following questions. The first one. Once you hit midlife, there's nothing you can do to improve your skin health. Fiction. Good. Acne is caused by a bad diet. That's fiction. Oh. We should avoid sugar altogether if we want to achieve the best skin health. Fiction. We shouldn't eat dairy as it's linked to paralysis and eczema. Fiction. Eating lots of fruits and vegetables, lean proteins, oils, and healthy fats and whole grains is important for skin health. Fact. Oh, we touched on this one. <laughs> Following a ketogenic diet is the most optimal for glowing health. Oh, no. No fiction. <laughs> Hydration is overrated when it comes to skin health. Uh, do you know? I would say that's fact. You don't need to have litres and litres. Okay. You don't need to have your four, like four litres of... You, but you do need to drink enough. I literally just looked at my water so I need to drink more water, but that's good to know. Um, removing gluten, dairy and alcohol from our diets will have a positive impact on our skin. Fiction. Just the alcohol. Yeah, we haven't touched on gluten, have we? We'll do that after. And vitamin D is important for a number of processes in our body, but it's also key to our skin and hair. Definitely, so that's fact. And finally, nutritional deficiencies such as low iron can show up in our hair and skin. Absolutely. See that all the time, fact. Yeah. Thank you so much. You. Fantastic fact or fiction. Gluten, before we wrap yes. up, I feel like the, the phase still hasn't yet died of the fear of gluten. Gluten phobia, yes. yes. So I think there's very specific instances where you do need to cut out gluten. So, you know, if you have celiac disease, mm -hmm. obviously you need to cut out gluten. That can present with just a skin rash on yeah. the elbows, an itchy rash. For some people with psoriasis who have positive blood tests, removing gluten is also really important. Oh. And some people who have a wheat allergy with eczema need to cut out gluten as well. So it's very specific. It's not a catch-all. doesn't do anything for acne. It's definitely not a, you know, cure-all for all skin problems. And with the skin, with different various conditions and things that you see, does the dietary guidelines change for each condition a little bit? Definitely. So yeah. you have to tweak because the evidence is different for each skin mm. condition. So you've got to tweak slightly what you say depending on what people are coming to you with. Absolutely. Amazing. Well, sadly, it wraps up the episode. <laughs> I'm devastated because I feel like I need to go and see you now to book in. Also, just to discuss my children. And I think... That's a food for thought today. Mine definitely, my take home message is that we are so unique. I know we deserve unique care and attention, but please, if there's one message, it's you need to know who to go to or who to watch or who to look at for you for skin advice. Y you won't see us recommending one size fits all approaches. I would look at that almost as a red flag for people looking at skincare products that this is the miracle for everyone. Um, what would be your take home message today? So I think remember that skincare is a holistic approach. Yeah. It's not just that new expensive cream. It's everything. It's your diet. It's managing your stress levels and skincare as well. But we are here with medical treatments if you need it as well. Absolutely. Now, 
Where can we go to learn more about you, your book, your Instagram page, the work you're doing? Let's share it all. So uh, my book, you can buy it on Amazon. It's in Waterstones as well. Um, I do have a website and a very small social media account. Um, no, and our amazing. research study is called the Apple Study. If you have psoriasis and you're interested in diet, then please do reach out if you want to take part. Oh my goodness, what an opportunity, everyone. <laughs> that definitely. So how? So would they email you? I mean, everyone get the um, Skin Food book, obviously, with the four step solution and yeah where do, where do they reach out to be a part of the so study if they want to be part of the study it's at the apple study on social media um or you can find us on um the king's website yeah. we're diet and psoriasis project.co.uk oh Vivi, thank you so much for coming yeah. on food for thought we've had the best time thank you so much it's been great <laughs> 